Okay, it's our second lecture. Welcome. Um, agenda. We're going to start with a discussion of current issues in the media business. Um, I'm going to give you a brief history of media in the U.S., sort of starting back in colonial times up to the present. And in doing so, we'll review all the main media types that we'll be talking about in more detail in the weeks to come. Uh, and then because it's important to uh, our marketing effort here at FIT that we get you guys to think about international implications of things, not just be U.S. focused. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, WeChat, which is an extremely popular uh, app in China. I'm going to borrow from a lecture that a former student of mine gave to actually uh, this class, uh, which I taught in the spring as a live class. Um, I then want to go over once again some of our key media terms and concepts. And then we will go over the media journey my media journey assignment um, in some more detail because that's going to start your first one will be due um, next week for out of home. So a lot to cover. So I put all of these up here at the same time um, and these are some of the issues that uh, are going on today. And let's just start on the left here on the top data privacy. Of course, this is one of the biggest issues with today's media, online media, obviously, mostly. But also with pretty much every online retailer and company that um, has, custom, has its customers in a database. There's lots of information in there. Um, some companies have more information than others, of course. Google has a lot of information about us. Everything we search for can be traced back to us personally without too much trouble. Um, Facebook, same. Every group we're in, all our likes, all kinds of things like that are traced. And uh, Facebook has thousands and thousands of customer segments you can target on behalf of advertisers. This is called micro-targeting. Um, Amazon knows a lot about us, too, don't they? Uh, those of us who are members of Amazon Prime, although... It's funny, I think there's a bit of a backlash to Amazon these days for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, I'm sure if we were in a classroom and I asked people to raise their hands and shop at Amazon regularly, a lot of you would raise your hands. So they have data. They have things we bought, things we've looked at. Um, and the privacy issue is that... Um, as uh, a number of people have said, if you're not paying for a service that you're getting, like most of us, uh, we don't pay for Facebook, we don't pay for Google, uh, chances are you're the product. <laughs> so um, all of these companies are using our data uh, for their own benefit, for their own marketing efforts, and they're also um, selling our data, yours and my data, to other companies, marketing companies who want to sell us things and know things about us. Um, this is easier to do in the United States than it is in Europe. Uh, Europe has a, a stricter uh, data uh, privacy policy, um, and it's more, I think you could say, consumer friendly, whereas the U.S. is at this point more business friendly, but Recent happenings with Facebook, notably the Cambridge Analytica fiasco, um, have brought data privacy issue to the attention of our government and our Congress. And so there is talk about uh, being stricter on the privacy front. So nevertheless, this is an issue that's really in play in a big way. And you'll see articles if you read newspapers or anything to do with media, you'll see articles about this issue a lot. Another one is uh, fake news slash lack of editorial control of social media. Fake news is a sort of misleading uh, uh, name, I think, for what we're talking about here. Because fake news is, has been used probably too broadly. Um, 
by some people to talk about real fake news that's been made up and by other people to criticize news that they may not like. Um, so it gets a bit confusing, this fake news idea. But um, the real issue here is lack of editorial control on social media. Because when you crowdsource your content and let anyone put up anything they want um, with very little in the way of uh, filtering or editorial control, as we all know, uh, and once again, this is at the feet of the social networks. Uh, and lots of people get their news and information from social networks. Um, and there's a lot of false, bad information in there uh, designed to influence you and me and everybody else to believe things and do things and take actions. Um, and designed in many cases by people who have access to our profiles. And uh, once again, we get back to this Cambridge Analytica thing. And of course, the same thing that happened in the U.S. with Cambridge Analytica happened in uh, Britain, the U.K., around the time of Brexit vote. Um, people analyzing um, our personality types, etc., and our likes and dislikes on social, from information gleaned from social media then testing different headlines and different ways of pitching points of view. And then um, after testing and finding winners where people are reading and opening it and forwarding it, et cetera, or liking it, um, you know, expanding those programs. So when there's no filter, when there's no one in between those who put up the news and those who consume the news, and here we get back to this idea of a medium being in the middle of things. Most of the media up till now, up till uh, crowdsourced content media like Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, etc., most of the media there was, you couldn't just put anything you wanted up. There was a filter in between. Someone who reinforced community standards, someone who would check the veracity of the story before it was published. Uh, this was been the tradition in media for hundreds of years, but now it is not anymore. So... Um, in other words, um, the, the medium that's in between the one who wants to communicate and the one who's receiving the communications is almost like a window. Uh, I think you could say in the case of uh, social media, there's no point of view or anything else affecting it. It's direct. Um, a less, very, it's, 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 I guess less controversial. It's just a fact that, um, most media types are making moves to digital. Um, all print media, magazines, newspapers, TVs, all the old fashioned media types, um, are, uh, have digital, uh, you know, uh, entities parallel to them, the same sorts of content, et cetera, et cetera. And the dollars are moving to digital and, um, and the eyeballs are moving to digital and to more and more to the screens on your phone. So um, things that are printed and handled, or things that are on TV screens, etc., are slowly being, I think, uh, uh, eaten away. Um, let's see here. Uh, Micro-targeting targeting using demographics and psychographics, we talked about. That's this whole Cambridge Analytica, etc., um, Brexit uh, effort. Uh, that ran, this is using micro-targeting information on your personality, not just your age and your college you went to and your income. Um, and it's, you know, targeting you with messages designed to make you do things. Another sort of marketplace issue now, similar to the move to digital, is the consolidation of ownership. And I guess I would ask now, there was a, a pretty big headline about a media um uh, acquisition, a media merger, uh, just yesterday. Um, now the day I'm speaking here is, uh, Wednesday the 14th of August. So, um, you all should be aware now that, um, CBS and Viacom are merging. They used to be one company, now they're merging back together. And of course, uh, this is going to help them. Viacom with all of its cable channels and, uh, CBS with its network. Um, 
this is going to help them compete with Disney, which has bought Fox and has Marvel and uh, bought George Lucas's stuff, uh, all the Star Wars franchise. I mean, uh, um, AT and T, uh, Warner Brothers. Anyway, these entities um, in the media space and the communication space are getting bigger and bigger, and Therefore, there is a consolidation of ownership. And what are the implications, you know, for the world and for all of us out of that? Growth of possible monopolies. And this actually gets, gets us back to um, Facebook, probably, and Google, who have huge shares, market shares of their businesses. Um, and then go around and buy up competitors like uh, Facebook buying Instagram. And uh, it makes it harder for new companies to stick their nose in the in the air, or their foot in the water, or whatever the case may be. It's uh, hard to compete with such giants. And so, is this a problem? And you hear now in the campaigns on the Democratic side um, talk about wanting to take a close look at whether these some of these companies are monopolies and are stifling competition and are bad for the marketplace and bad for consumers. Um, then here at the bottom is decrease of investigative reporting. And uh, this uh, is uh, the fact that with the decline in the newspaper business, and newspapers for several hundred years were the foundation, the source, the fountain, if you will, of investigative reporting. Um, that's why there's such a thing established as a Pulitzer Prize, which I'm sure a number of you have heard of. Um, because newspapers uh, were there to kind of rip the cover off things and challenge those who are in power and blow the whistle, whatever you want to call it. And, and if you think about, you know, the Harvey Weinstein story recently, you think about even the Jeffrey Epstein story. And uh, here I am on Tuesday the 14th, and he just killed himself a couple of days ago. But it was a reporter, I think, from the Miami Herald who... Um, went back and uh, dug up a bunch of facts and brought this whole thing back, this whole story back. And uh, as a result of it, the secretary of uh, whatever he was secretary of in the cabinet, Acosta was the last name, had to resign because he went in a previous job. He was uh, a, a federal attorney of, uh, in the Southern District, and there was a suspicious deal made with Epstein. So he's lost his job in the cabinet. We don't know what will happen to him. Um, and a number of victims of this Jeffrey Epstein have now stepped forward. And it remains to be seen uh, what the next steps will be here. But investigative reporting. Uh, think about Watergate. You know anything about that? That was a long time ago. But newspapers with their revenues down uh, can't afford to have these big newsrooms, can't afford to have correspondence in all the major cities in the you wouldn't in the U.S., let alone the globe the way they used to. So who's going to do the investigative reporting? So at the same time, you have this increase of social uh, networking sites with um, no editorial control. You have a decrease in the power and the influence of a media type like newspapers uh, that were the opposite, that looked for truth and were, weren't afraid to say the truth to those in power. So we'll be talking about all these issues as we move forward. I wanted to bring these up just uh, as part of the uh, setting the stage, kind of make, making, giving you guys the picture of um, today's media world um, as we start to um, get into talking about separate media.